Mario! Man, it's good to see everybody. You have no idea. Man, that was good. That was real good. Amen? Amen. Man, give a shout to Jesus today. Come on! That ain't loud enough. That ain't loud enough. I heard a guy talk about hunting last night that was a lot more enthusiastic than that. Give a shout to Jesus today like you mean it. Yeah. Man, golly. It's good stuff right there. Mm, I love that last song. Absolutely love it. You know, this week I uh, did something I usually don't do. I listened to the first like five minutes of one of my, my sermon from like two weeks ago. And I was like, I have no idea how these people keep up with what I'm saying. Amen. Because I um a lot. Um, um, I, it's just not that good. Let's just be honest. But uh, I love what Jesus does. Amen. And I'm just so thankful that he allows me to preach his word. And um, there, there, see, there it is. Um, Oh, no, I have to wear. All right, here we go. But God's got something for us today, and I'm really excited about it. And um, there it is again. <laughs> okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let it go. But. We didn't notice until you noticed. I know, right? God wants you to know that He always has a plan. And I know that sometimes, man, we're walking through life and, and we're doing this life thing and, and, man, it gets hard and there's good times and there's bad times and, and there's things that happen that we feel like it throws us off course, don't we? But God wants you to know He always has a plan even in the storm. If we turn to, to Matthew 8, verse 23, um, Jesus... Um, gives his disciples a command because Jesus has a plan. In verse 23 it says, Then Jesus got to the boat and he started across the lake with his disciples. And suddenly a fierce storm struck the lake with waves breaking into the boat. Now can you imagine? Jesus tells you, like he tells a lot of us, go do this. Right? And we go at it with full confidence. Alright God. You tell me to do this, I'm going to do it. You tell me to start a church, I'm going to do it. You tell me to start a ministry, I'm going to do it. You tell me to talk to that person, I'm going to do it. You tell me to, to be an example, I'm going to do it, right? And then guess what happens? Wherever there's divine operation, right, there is satanic opposition, right? And so the enemy comes and he likes to try to throw some waves in your boat. And what do we do? Lord, are you sure you told us to do this? Are you sure you told us to get in this position? Are you sure you told me to talk to that person? Are you sure you told me to start this, right? Right here. Guys, I, I think it's very, very important to say and note that these guys that were in this boat weren't strangers to this lake. Were they? In fact, in this boat, you had some professional fishermen in this boat that knew this lake and had been out on the lake in these certain storms, right? This fierce storm blows up. Jesus tells them to go somewhere. This fierce storm blows up. There's waves crashing everywhere. It's coming into the boat. And guess what Jesus was doing? Sleeping. You know why? Because it doesn't surprise Him. You know what I'm saying? It doesn't surprise Him. We, we, we think that every storm we walk into or that the enemy throws at us or that we allow to come into our lives because we choose a lot of storms, don't we? Let's be honest. We choose a lot of storms through our own willful sin. And we, we're, we're going through and we think it's the biggest storm we've ever gone through that we can never make it through this storm and Jesus is, we feel like Jesus is sleeping. Don't we? Jesus, can you not see what I'm going through? Jesus, I feel alone. Jesus, I can't feel your presence. Why are you asleep in the boat with me right now? And Jesus says, it's not that big of a storm. It, it didn't surprise me that this storm blew up. In fact, when I told you to go to the other side, I had a purpose. See, I still have a plan. But right here, Jesus is asleep in the boat. 
And the disciples went and they woke him up shouting, Lord, save us, we're going to drown. How many of you feel like that today? Lord, save me, I'm going to drown. Lord, save me, I'm going to drown. Jesus is asleep. You ain't going to drown. You're not going to drown. With Jesus on board with you, you will never drown. You know why? Because He won't let you. But so many times we think that's going to happen. Jesus responded, why are you so afraid? You have so little faith. Then he got up and he rebuked the wind and the waves, and they suddenly, there was, and suddenly there was a great calm. And the disciples were amazed. This right here, this verse right here, blows my mind. Does it blow yours? Then the disciples said, "Who is this man that even the winds and the waves obey him?" That blows my mind. And why it blows my mind is because we have to look at the context all around this. You see, right before this happened, Jesus just got done preaching the Sermon on the Mount. Okay? He preached the Sermon on the Mount in front of all these people, gave some awesome words, some awesome things that, that He was doing. So He preaches the Sermon on the Mount. And, 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 and if you read that, Everyone that, that was sitting under Jesus at the Sermon on the Mount said that they were amazed because He spoke with real authority. He spoke with real authority from the Holy Spirit that nobody of that time was doing. Not even the religious leaders, not even the guys that were high up in, in, in the religious law and at, at the synagogues. They didn't even speak with that kind of real authority. And so these disciples were there when this took place, right? The disciples were there and they, they heard Jesus speak and, 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 and they believed that He spoke with real authority from the Holy Spirit. We also see that right before Jesus tells them to get in the boat, He heals a man with leprosy. Like, God walks up, disciples too scared, like, Jesus, you know that dude got leprosy? Like, do you know that, Jesus? Like, Jesus don't know. How many times do we act like Jesus don't know? All the time. All the time. God walks up with leprosy. Jesus heals him. In fact, Jesus said, what do you want me to do for you? And he said, I want you to heal me. And he said, you're healed. He was healed of leprosy. So the disciples walking with him saw this. So let's add this up. He's speaking with real authority that they've never heard before. They're following him around. A guy with leprosy, which is a you know an unclean dude in that time, right? Because he has sores on his skin, walks up to him. Jesus says, You're healed. And that, that happens right in front of them. And then Jesus speaks to the Roman, you know, the Roman soldier comes to Jesus and he says, listen, my, my child is sick. I need you to heal him. He says, but guess what? I'm not worthy for you to come to my house. How many of you feel like Jesus isn't worthy to come to your house? I promise you, you are. For the Roman soldiers, like, you're not worthy to come to my house, but because I know the order of authority, you see, all you got to do, I know all you got to do is speak it and it will be done. And Jesus said, because of your faith, it is done. And it says in that same hour, the child was healed. It, like, like, the disciples are walking with Jesus seeing this. They're seeing the authority like they've never seen before. They're seeing the power of the Holy Spirit like they never have before. In fact, Jesus, He walks into Peter's house with the rest of the disciples. And Peter's mother-in-law is sick. And, and, and He heals her. He lays His hand on her. And He makes her well. He heals her from her ailment. And she is so well within the, the, within the minutes following that she gets up and she prepares a meal for Him. The disciples saw this. The disciples saw this. They saw what Jesus was doing. After eating the meal that the woman prepared that Jesus had just healed, it says that many people that were demon-possessed came to Jesus and they were healed. The disciples are watching all of this. And still, verse 27, who is this man? 
You know what happens? We are just like that. We are just like that. Because we can't find the faith in the hard times. And you're either one of two people. You either really thrive with Jesus in the hard times, right? Because that's all you got to, to grasp to. Or you really thrive with Jesus in the good times because they're good and you're praising. Right? But so many times it's hard to either praise Him in the bad or praise Him in the good based on the way we think, right? Jesus has, show, Jesus has shown Himself to you all throughout your life. In fact, is everyone here not breathing? In fact, was everyone here not formed in your mother's womb? And did your mother not give birth to you? And are you not made in the image of God? And if you are saved, are you not a child of God? Right? You are a breathing, living testimony sitting right here. Have you not been through some things? Has He not forgiven you of your sin? See, so many times we get in this mindset as Christians where we feel like, like we're too good and we forget what all Jesus has forgiven us for. Right? And, and, and we get in this mindset that we forget that salvation is a miracle. That we forget surrender is a miracle. We forget sacrifice, laying your life down at the altar to Jesus is a miracle. Why? Because it is a choice that He puts in your head that you choose to do. That's a miracle. He worked a miracle in your life. There are some of you that should not be sitting here today. There are some of you that death has literally come knocking at your door and Jesus said, I'm not done. I'm not done with them. I want to tell you today that if you are breathing, God is not done. There is still a purpose for you. There is, he still has a plan for you. No matter what you've been going through, there is still a plan. And this storm, this circumstance, this situation has not surprised Him. It has not thrown Him off. Jesus ain't up there and been like, oh man, shoot. I didn't even see that coming, bro. <laughs> I don't know what you want to do now. No, because I'm going to tell you. You see, and I might be jumping ahead, I don't really know, but if we read the next story, it says, when they made landfall on the other side of the lake, there were two men that needed deliverance. Y'all read that? When they made landfall on the other side of the lake, you see, Jesus said, meet me on the other side. Guess where the other side was? The other side was, hey, there's two guys over there that are demon-possessed that need, that need deliverance. And in fact, let's go ahead and read it. And I mean, when Jesus arrived, hold on. Let me read verse 23. Then Jesus got to the boat, started to cross, okay? So, he told him to go to the other side. When Jesus arrived on the other side of the lake in the region of the Gadarenes, two men who were possessed by demons met him. They came out of their tombs and were so violent that no one could go through that area. Y'all see how much authority Jesus has here? Did y'all just read what I just read? These dudes were so out of control that nobody went through that area. Nobody attempted to go through that area. Why? Because these dudes were crazy. These dudes were out of control. These, no, nobody could control these men. Nobody could talk sense into these men. You understand? And they came out to meet Jesus and they began screaming at Him. Why are you interfering with us, Son of God? You see, even the demons know who Jesus is. Come on. Even the demons know who Jesus is. They called Him by His name. Why are you here to interfere with us, Son of God? 
have you come here to torture us before God's appointed time? The power of Jesus. I love that. When you speak with the power of the Holy Spirit and the authority of the Holy Spirit, you torment demons. That goes too deep today. All right. There happened to be a large herd of pigs feeding in the distance, so the demons begged, hey, listen, can you cast us out and throw us into those, that herd of pigs? And Jesus said, all right, go. His voice, his words had weight. His words had anointing. His words had authority. Why? Because they were through the Holy Spirit, through God. So he said, all right, go. Jesus commanded them, and so the demons came out of the man and entered the pigs. And the whole herd plunged it uh, down the steep hillside into the lake that they were in, right? That they just went through. And they drowned in the water. And the herdsmen fled to the nearby town, telling everyone what had happened to the demon-possessed men. And, you know, mo like us, most of the time, we just can't believe that something that amazing happened. So the entire town came out to Jesus, and they begged him to go away and leave them alone. They begged him to go away and leave them alone. You see, God gave me something, and I've got, I've got to go back because I forgot to mention this about the storm. In this particular storm, we had pro fishermen out there who had been in storms before, who had who knew how to work a boat, who knew what they were doing, who were very familiar with the lake they were on, much like some of you are familiar with the lakes that you've been on. And Jesus said, you have so little faith. You see, because here's what happened. In that particular storm, Jesus let that storm get to a point in their life that they could no longer depend on their own works. They could no longer depend on their own strength. You get that? They had to go wake Jesus up because I can't do this. And I want to tell you when, you, when you are going through an upgrade, when you are going through a faith upgrade, okay, you're going to go through storms where you say, I can't do it. And you know what Jesus says? I can. Have faith. Know who I am. And I just find that so, I find that so amazing that they could not rely on their own knowledge, their own wisdom, their own strength. And many times that's, that, that, that's what happens to us. That, that, that we get to a point where we cannot do that. But we see here that God still has a plan. You see, <clears throat> Paul, how many of y'all love Paul? Love his writings, love his teachings. Man, I love Paul. And, and, and we've preached this before, so I know that you know this. But you, you do understand that Paul was in prison most of the time when he was writing the letters that make up most of the New Testament. Y'all realize that? You realize that? Because here's what we would do, okay? Here's what we do. I'm in prison. So here's what we do. Well, I'm in prison. Bro, I don't even know why I'm in here. I've been doing good things. I've been preaching God's Word. I'm in, I'm in here. This is what we would do, wouldn't it? And, and then we would let our emotions get the best of us, and then we'd just shut down, right? Everybody else over here getting blessed. They ain't in here. Bro. Y'all playing if y'all acting like this ain't y'all. <laughs> Because this is me, right? <laughs> Jesus. <clears throat> I mean, is this the... Jesus, like, I'm doing everything you tell me to do, and you put me in this prison. You want to know why Paul might have had to be in a prison? So that he would sit and be still and write down what God told him to write. <laughs> See, sometimes God puts you in prison so that you'll stop running around, stop being so busy, and you'll sit down and sit patiently with Him so he can tell you what he's trying to tell you. Because if, if you don't sit down and be still, you will never get what God is trying to tell you. But 
that's we act like we act like prison is a jail. No. It's God saying, sit there and be still, son. Sit there and be still, daughter, and listen to what I've got to tell you. Because of what I've got to tell you is going to take you to the next level. What I've got to tell you is going to lead you and guide you and hey, that mustard seed, that's all you've got to have is that mustard seed? Check this out. I don't know if he wants me to tell me who gave it to him, so, but I won't. That's a mustard seed from the Holy Land. That'd be a mustard seed. Guess what happens? When that mustard seed, can y'all see it back there in the back? Yeah. Barely? Yeah. When that mustard seed, I'm going to let everybody see it on TV. <laughs> when that mustard seed starts to grow, guess what happens? The seed has to die so that it can start growing into a tree. Right? And so, here's the deal. Hey, when you're getting upgraded, it's not always going to feel good. It's not always going to look the way you think it should look. But God has a plan. He always has a plan. You know, one thing that I've been reading this week, and, and it, it kind of blew my mind, was Hebrews 10.10. 10. And it really just blew my mind. And I was like, Lord, I, I just don't understand. Like, I mean, like, I guess I understand. But right here in Hebrews 10.10 10, it says, For God's will was for us to be made holy by the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all time. And when I read that, I was like, God. Like we always, you know, think God's will is all good and beautiful and, and it's always rainbows and butterflies and it's always, you know, thick, luscious pastures and, you know, right? Right? For God's will was for us to be made holy. By what? By the sacrifice of His Son. But guess what? God had a plan. Because you see, God knew that He wasn't going to stay dead. God knew that the most important part of this whole process was the resurrection on the third day. You see what I'm saying? God had a plan. And how many people did Jesus minister to the 40 days after He rose and then ascended? You see, He, he, he ministered to His disciples showing them who is this man? This man is the Son of God. And I'm going to prove it to you by the sign of Jonah, which is three days down, and then I come up again, baby. You know what I'm saying? Dude, that is so good. That is so good, but so many times, man, we, we, we forget that we forget that sacrifice sometimes is not easy. Sacrifice means pruning. Sacrifice means, hey, I've got to give something up right here because God's asking me to. And many of us are living our life every single day with God asking us to give something up because it's going to take us to the next level and we keep being stubborn and keeping it in our pocket and moving forward. Don't we? And I'm not going to go into all that today. I you know, Peter, when we look at the story of Peter, A lot of times we only like to look at Peter's story when he's preaching after the day of Pentecost or at the day of Pentecost and after and like all these people are coming to the kingdom of God, right? Like that's the, that's the story that we love to talk about. But we forget that Peter denied Jesus three times before the rooster crowed. Y'all remember that? You see, most of the time in your life, there's always a valley before there's a mountain. You know why? Because Jesus got to make sure he can trust you with what he's about to give you. So Peter right here, man, he, Jesus, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to die with you. Like if this is what we're doing tonight, this is what we're doing. I'm your ride or die. Literally. Let's do this, right? And so, and, and Jesus says, no, see, Peter, 
You're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows, but guess what? I've got a plan. Peter couldn't even see the plan. If Jesus would have told him the plan, he wouldn't even be able to believe it. You see, I can't remember, it's Hezekiah or somewhere, where where God says, if I told you what I had planned, you couldn't believe it. Right here, if, if Jesus would have told Peter what he had planned, Peter probably wouldn't have believed it. You see, Peter rejected Jesus three times, and then Peter led, on the day of Pentecost, Peter came out and preached, and 3,000 people were brought to the kingdom of God. Jesus had a plan. And I know that some of us are, some of us right now, we might be in the dark days. We might be walking through the valley of the shadow of death. And I want you to know that God has a plan. And I want you to know that if you will accept that plan, that you will not stay there. He will walk you right out of it. Amen? And I know that some of us right now, we're starting to build up the faith. You know, hey, I said it in the prayer today. Like, we need people to step up. You know what I'm saying? Like, we need media. We need computer help. We, 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 we got to mow again this week. Like, like th- th- there is a lot of things here that you can step up and do. But I'm going to tell you, listen. Oh, I don't even know where I was going with that. What was I saying? What? Oh, yeah. God is leading you. Right, right, right now, some of you are walking in to that. Oh, I want to do it, but I don't know. Lord, I, I don't know. It looks scary. I don't want to mess up. Right? Um, I don't really know a whole lot about what you're telling me to do. Father, you asked me to sing. No, I ain't going to sing. You know, I, I think God is for, you know, helping my voice. I don't know. Probably not. But really, I used to ask Caitlin to sing all the time. She told me no. It's okay. But I, but 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 really, like some of us are right there at that point where it's like it's time to take that step, but we won't do it. You know why? Because we don't we don't trust in God's plan. We don't trust in His plan. We don't trust that He has something better for us. You know, I I told a story. Many, many, well, a few years ago, you know, about how we woke up early one morning and I was going to take Gunner to get Dale's Donuts. And like, I was like, come on, buddy, let, let, let's go. And, and he just threw a fit. No, he had to have powdered donuts before he left the house. I've got to have powdered donuts. If he would have just trusted me and my plan, he was going to get the best donuts in the world. Yeah. Right? We are looking for sponsorships. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> right? we, we, I was going to take him to get the best, like, don't settle for the counterfeit. Come on, come on. Don't settle for the thing that looks good in this moment that's going to get you out of this mess or out of this storm. Trust God that on the other side, what He's going to give you is going to be the best blessing you've ever received. Yeah. And we don't do that. Then we look at John, right? We hear a lot about John. Do we understand and realize that John didn't write Revelations until they, they, they removed him for persecution? And they said, listen, you're going to go to the island of Patmos and, 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 and you're going to stay over there because you're going to be exiled over there, man. You, you can't preach that no more. So here's John sitting on an island. By the way, I looked up Patmos. It's a pretty nice island today. I don't think it was back then. But John is sitting on this island. And he's like, I I, I can only imagine him being like, God, you told me what to do. I was following your plan. And I still end up here? How many of y'all feel like that right now? God, you told me what to do. I followed that. And I'm here? I'm here? I'm here? He says, yeah. He says, yeah. I have a plan. And you're like, God, I can't see it right now. I can't see this plan right now. 
John got put on an island. And that, not, not until he got put on that island, was when he started having visions. And when he started writing the book of Revelations. Why? Because he sat still and let God speak to him. Revelations probably would not have been written if he wasn't put on that island. Right? Because he was busy doing what God wanted him to do. Sometimes God says, you're doing what I want you to do, but hey, I'm going to put you in time out for a second so you can rest and get your breath. You're like, God, I can't do that. I can't, I can't do that. It was funny today. And I, it's funny today, I was talking to Devin and I was like, all right, so we're going to do Thursday. We're going to do, we're going to mow. And I said, I'm going to come early because I have football practice for Gunner. So I'm going to come early and I'm going to weed eat so I can do something. And Kayla said, you have to do something. But y'all have no idea how much, like I, I don't think she understands how important that, that just that statement was. Because for a long time I've been judged on how good of a pastor I am by my works. And Jesus says, you're not going to get there with your works. You're going to get there with your relationship with me. Right? And so there's some walls that have to be broken down in that aspect. Right? But I feel like a lot of us today sit here and I know that, that I just preach like get involved and, and do things for the Lord, but I'm going to tell you today that if you're so busy that you can't look up working for the Lord, you might not be doing what all you're supposed to be doing. Because there's some times where He says, sit, be still, stop, you're too busy, the enemy is distracting you, calm down. We don't know exactly what John was going through when when he got exiled to the to the uh, to the island of uh, Patmos, but or Patmos or whatever y'all want to call it, but we do know that God put him there for a reason. And I'm going to tell you this: God has you right here for a reason. The purpose and the vision of this church has not changed. And you might maybe be asking, "What is the purpose? What is the vision?" It's to be a beacon of light right here in this community where He planted us. Understand? And there's some things that God's given me and I'm really excited about. I'm super pumped about. But we talked about this a few, uh, about a year ago. All of us have to be prepared before the next step. Because guess what? Your leadership team can't do everything. All of us have to be prepared. All of our faith has to grow. We all have to, have to go through these things. And God said, guess what? I have a plan. I have a plan. That plan hasn't changed. This time has not changed. You still have a purpose. You are still valuable. You are still worthy. I love it. You know, in, in, in Isaiah 43, 7, in Amplified Version, it says, Everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory, whom I have formed, even whom I have made. So right here, he says, I have called everyone to my name, and I have created everyone to bring me honor and glory. And I know I said this a few minutes ago, but that is your one job, is to bring God honor and glory. That is your one job. And guess what? Your job might look a lot different than my job. I don't sing as good as Caitlin. That's her job. Bring honor and glory to Jesus through, through singing. That is not mine. I was just kidding earlier. Right? I mean, David's way to bring God honor and glory is to play that guitar, and it is amazing. And I love it. And Shane just play those drums. He plays them a lot better than I ever did. 
I'm so glad God sent him here. Love you so much. Right? And, and guess what? Guess what? Other people's job is to keep other people in line. Right? And some people's job is to take care of things. And some people's job is to minister to people. And some people's job is to, is to uh, cook food for people. And I mean... My, my mom told me the other day, you have no idea how much food your aunt cooks and takes to people that are in need. If that is your gift, then let that gift ride. If your gift is, is God always putting people on your mind and on your heart to text and to reach out to, do it. Call them. Whatever that is, bring honor and glory to God because He has a plan. I'm going to ask the, the band to come on up. It's a little bit shorter today. But I want to take a few, I want to take a few minutes here. And I just want everyone to kind of, just, I know you, you might not want to, and, and you don't have to. I'm not telling you you have to, but I'll, I'd like everybody to just close their eyes real quick. Close your eyes. And picture yourself at the foot of the cross. Everybody there? Picture yourself at the foot of the cross. Now I want you to reflect on all of the blessings that God has given you. All of the blessings. All of the things that He's walked you through. All of the things that He's given you. And I'm not talking about monetary and financial right now. I'm talking about all the things He has given you, your family, your friends, your loved ones. I'm talking about every time, man, you thought that you weren't going to make it to the next paycheck, you did. And every time you thought you were about to be homeless, God gave you a home. And every time you prayed for that spouse that you're sitting by, you wondered if God would ever give her to you, ever give him to you. And guess what? He did. Your children, that you love so dearly. I want you to reflect on all the miracles that have taken place in your life. Think about them. Your salvation. Your kids' salvation. Your family's salvation. Your mom, your dad. And I know that some of you don't have the best mom or dad to look up to. I understand that. But look at how God walked you through that. All the miracles, all the plans, that took place just like Caitlin said earlier. God is in the very smallest of details. And He cares about you that much and He loves you that much to walk with you through those details. Why? Because He loves you. All of those miracles, man. All of that healing, man. And I'm not just talking about about physical healing. I'm not just talking about when you said God take this headache away and you took it away. I'm talking about I'm talking about the, the hurts that are deep inside your heart that, that, that the enemy tried to plant in. All the sin that has tried to infiltrate your mind and your soul and your heart that the enemy has tried to plant in there that God has set you free from. That God has delivered you from. I'm talking about all of that. And when we think about all of those things, all God wants to do is tell you, I can be trusted. I have a plan. You know, in Hebrews, you can open your eyes. In Hebrews 4, 14, or you can keep them closed if you're still reflecting. 
In Hebrews 4, 14, it says, Since then, or I'm sorry, so then, since we have this great high priest who has entered heaven, which is Jesus, he left heaven to fulfill the prophecy to become your high priest. To become the mediator between God and you. It says, when he ascended, guess what? He entered heaven. Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses. For he faced all of the same testings that we do. Yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There. There. When we come into God's presence, when we walk into the throne room of God, there and only there will we receive His mercy and will we find grace to help us get through when we need it most. You see, only in the presence of God, man, can you get through some of the things that you get through. Only in the presence of God. See, you, you can't tell me any other thing about Paul and John and, and uh, you know, Peter. Their revelations happened in the presence of God. They found grace in the presence of God. They found mercy in the presence of God. They didn't find it in their friends or the other disciples or the brother, their brothers or sisters or moms or dads, grandma and grandpa. They found all of those things in the presence of God. And what that piece of scripture right there tell, tells me personally is Jesus Christ is my everything. Jesus Christ is my everything. I want to tell you, I want to ask you to come right now. If you don't know what God's plan is, if you're in the middle of it and you don't know, you're like, God, I need you. Come on. If you have never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you don't know what that is for Him to be your everything, for, for, for the freedom of Christ to just pour over your life, pour over your soul, pour over your mind and truly be free from all of those chains that you have put on yourself. I pray that you come right now. If you just need the peace of the presence of God, if you need the grace of the presence of God, if you need the mercy of the grace of God, I pray that you come right now. Because guess what? You're not going to find it in the bottle. You're not going to find it in the substance. You're not going to find it in the friends. You're not going to find it in your mom or your dad. They can give you some peace, but it's not what Jesus is going to give. I know my mama always made things better. The job isn't going to make it better. The house, the vehicles, the boats, they're not going to make it better. All the things that you acquire aren't going to make it better. All that's only found in the presence of God. Father, I come to you today and I thank you so much, Father, for this word. Father, I hope it spoke to your people today. I, Father, I just praise you and I love you so much, Father. I just thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your mercy, for your grace. Father, because it shows up when we need it most. And I love that so much. Father, may we be in constant reflection and constant reminder of the blessings and the miracles 
that you have given us, Father. The miracle that I just breathed a breath. The miracle that I just spoke a word. The miracle that I'm standing up at this platform instead of sitting or lying. Father, that's a miracle. Father, it's a miracle that my feet work. It's a miracle that my muscles have, have developed correctly, Father, for me to stand. And every morning when I wake up, I'm able to get out of bed. Father, that's a miracle. Father, it's a miracle that I'm doing what I'm doing. It's a miracle that I'm not in jail. It's a miracle that I'm not dead. I remember those things. I remember those times. God, I remember that night around that curve when if there would have been somebody coming, we would all have been dead. I remember that. But you had a plan. Even when I was doing wrong, even when I was doing things that, that weren't for you, that were against you, Father, you still had a plan for my life. Father, when I was doing those things and chasing those things that, that aren't of you, that just the world says is going to fulfill me, Father, you gave me mercy. What a miracle, what a blessing, Father. God, I remember praying, Father, for Tara when I didn't even know Tara. Wondering if you were ever going to send me someone, God, because let's just be honest, I wanted, to some, I wanted someone to love me other than my, my family, other than my mom, my sister, my dad, my brother, my grandma. Father, you provided that. What a blessing. God, I just love you, Father. I praise you. Because you always have a plan. I can, I can trust you in your plan no matter what. God, you know it's been rocky. God, you know it. I, I felt like I've been about to drown. God, you know that. And yet I've been just resting on your life breath, Father. Why? Because you have a plan. That plan hasn't changed. That plan hasn't surprised you. You're like, hey, I know, bro. I got you. Let me come on. Father, thank you. Father, may, may we all count our blessings today. And thank you, Father. In your sense, I'm afraid. Amen.